All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. I uh, want to thank everybody for, for joining us this morning for um, a webinar focused on Oklahoma and, and the retail trends we're seeing in Oklahoma now um, into 2021, which we're in right now, and then beyond. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll jump into this. I'll, I'll point out just a couple of housekeeping items real quick, uh, but you should see on your screen a button, a Q&A button. So if you have any questions uh, from a Q&A, uh, or from a question standpoint, as we go along, feel free to ask those and we'll try to get to those uh, during the presentation, but also at the end. Um, so we'll leave some time for question and answers at the end, but uh, really appreciate everybody taking time out of their day uh, this morning. Uh, we'll go through this pretty quick, maybe 45 minutes together. Uh, again, just talking about the retail trends and, uh, and what we're seeing specific to Oklahoma. So uh, my name is Aaron Farmer. I'm the president of The Retail Coach. Uh, I've been with The Retail Coach going, going on about 13 years now. Um, we've been working with uh, municipalities and economic development organizations um, in Oklahoma and throughout the U.S. for the last, uh, last 21 years. So excited to, uh, excited to speak to you today um, and, and excited to, to, to be doing this webinar in association with the Oklahoma Municipal League. Um, you know, Mike, I, I see Mike is on here now with us and, and Mike and his team have been great to work with through this process. I had a chance uh, to, to be on Mike's podcast, uh, the Oklahoma Municipal League podcast a couple of weeks ago and, and, and thoroughly enjoyed that. So um, appreciate the, the opportunity to partner on this webinar to, to get some relevant information out to your to your members uh, focused on retail. So, again, we'll jump into this. And like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them as we as we move along here. So a little bit of background just on the retail coach and what we do. I mentioned this already, but but we work a lot in the South and Southwest. So we spend a lot of time in Oklahoma, a lot of time in Texas, New Mexico, Arkansas, Louisiana, but we work with municipalities. We work with economic development organizations, uh, number one, to help them understand what their retail opportunity is. And then number two, to go out and help existing businesses and also recruit new businesses to the community. So uh, that's a little bit about our background. I mentioned I've been doing this with a retail coach for about 13 years, but, you know, really want to talk to you about trends to start with and, and really talk to you about what we're seeing uh, in Oklahoma, but across the country from a retail standpoint. You know, it's no secret, but uh, we're going through COVID uh, and we have been since since late February, early March. And, you know, the retail industry has taken a hit because of that. Uh, but, but it's not as bad of a hit, I think, as, as, as you, would, you would think if you're watching the news programs and, and, and different cable news shows. Retail is still strong. I mean, we have lost some retailers and restaurants, and we'll, we'll talk through that. But the, the, the future is bright for retail, and we're already starting to see that. Um, for example, the holiday sales. You know, I always look at, we always look at in the retail industry, we look at 2020 or the year prior's holiday sales to see, you know, how well will we do this next year? And um, I have some good news from that same point. Uh, holiday sales grew by about 8.3% uh, in, in 2020. So from 2019, we were up about 8.3% to $789 billion uh, in total retail sales during that holiday time period. The online sales, the online holiday sales grew by about 23.9% uh, to $209 billion. So online sales have accelerated this year. Uh, because of COVID, you know, with the, whether it was uh, buying online or picking up, uh, we've seen a lot of that happen uh, here in the recent future. Um, and I, I, I want to mention this real quick. We just had a question come across asking if this presentation will be available uh, to everyone. So everybody that's on here, everybody that signed up for the webinar, we will get this presentation out um, a little bit later today and then also a recording. So you'll get the actual slides and then a recording if you want to share that with any of your board members, council members, or, or other staff members. So we will get a copy of this out to everyone. Uh, but back to this, uh, really the retail sales for the holiday season were strong. Uh, we saw that, like I said, the holiday sales grew by 8.3%, online by 23.9%. But what really happened was the last two weeks uh, were the key to this incre increase. So it was too late for deliveries. Uh, USPS was having some trouble getting deliveries out to everyone. So really that last two weeks of, uh, of the holiday season 
uh, really we saw consumers taking advantage of, you know, quick in and out trips to their retailers and then the buy online and pick up in store and also curbside. So you can see at the bottom of this, of this slide here, you can see some of those sectors that, that saw some pretty big bumps or some pretty big increases. Uh, and, and some of those were building materials and garden supplies. Uh, they were up about 15%. Same thing with sporting goods up about 15%. Grocery did well really throughout all of COVID. We'll talk about that more in a minute, but you see some of the other categories that, that did well. General merchandise was down about 0.1% for the holiday sales. And then actually electronics and appliance stores were down about 14%. And then clothing took really the hardest hit during, during the holiday season. They were down about 14.9%. So um, what, the, what this slide means is the holiday sales were strong. We're expecting that to carry over into 2021 uh, and really expecting retail to be back full force by, by June or July of this year. So excited to see, uh, excited to see what's coming. Now, I, I did want to share this with you. Uh, we took a hard look at Oklahoma specifically to see, you know, really what what sectors, what retail sectors did well uh, in Oklahoma uh, during coronavirus. And I just wanted to kind of share you, show you this. Uh, restaurants took a hit. With some of your restaurants having to close or, or do uh, limited seating and those sort of things, around this February, late February, early March time period, we saw about a 70% decrease at restaurants and dining. However, we're starting, we saw an increase uh, into May and it's been pretty consistent. Da still down about 30% at your restaurants, uh, but we're starting to see those number ri numbers rise. So, uh, you know, been very interesting to see uh, which sectors have done well and which have, which have struggled, but restaurants, we're starting to see a comeback here. Uh, grocery, the grocery sector has done incredibly well uh, during COVID. Uh, we saw a big peak around, again, kind of March, early March, early to mid-March time period. I, this is the, the toilet paper peak, I call it. Uh, that's when we saw a lot of the panic buying happening. Um, and then we saw a drop, you know, down about 20%, but then, but then grocery is, has really stayed close to that baseline and grocery has done well. Um, so expect to see some grocery, uh, grocery expansion, some new grocery stores happening probably later this year uh, into 2022. The grocery industry has done well and we're expecting some expansion in that industry. Another one that's done incredibly well, another sector is home improvement. So whether it was Lowe's, Home Depot, the Ace Hardwares of the world, uh, we, a lot of us were stuck at home. We were working at home, especially towards the beginning of the pandemic and, and many of us still now. Uh, but we saw an increase in home improvement, whether it was, you know, these do-it-yourself uh, home projects or spring cleanings or spring plantings that we saw. Uh, consistently, the home improvement sector has stayed above that baseline, above that average line. So that's continuing. And even, uh, even now, as we, as we get into spring over the next couple of months, we expect the home improvement sales to continue to go up. Um, this has been interesting because the Lowe's, the Home Depot's, and some of these other home improvement stores have struggled or were struggling pre-COVID and then now they're doing incredibly well during COVID. So expect uh, to see some, uh, some expansion with, with retailers and restaurants in the home improvement industry. Ace Hardware is a good example. They're one of the fastest growing retailers right now and uh, they've taken advantage of this growth that's, that's taken place during COVID. Another one that's done well, continue to do well, is superstores. So your Costco's, your Walmart's, your Sam's Clubs, those those types, your Targets, they've done well. Again, just like we saw in the grocery and some of these other categories, we saw that 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 panic buying peak I talked about. We saw a drop, you know, really around the middle of March when a lot of things were just closed down and, and everybody was in quarantine. But again, we saw a rise here uh, in superstores, so they're back to to normal now uh, to their baseline and continuing to do well. One thing that's been interesting at these superstores is though maybe we haven't had as many visits by consumers to these superstores, the average ticket price has gone way up. So if, if, you're, if you're a community and you've noticed some, some higher to normal you know, retail sales or sales tax in your community, uh, but, but maybe the stores don't seem as busy, it's because those, those major or the, the ticket, I, the, the ticket have, have, the tickets have gone up. The total ticket price has gone up. So that's something we're continuing to see, and I think will will stick with us for a while now. And then uh, just one one category that has struggled, but but is making a comeback. They struggled really all of March, April, and May was the apparel industry. Um, you probably noticed this, but a lot of the apparel stores were closed, and you had to really just go to their online stores to 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 buy anything. However, we saw again that big that big drop 
March, April, May, but we're starting to see it come back in apparel. Um, so expect to see the apparel stores offering big sales uh, to get you back to stores starting in the spring, really starting now, but starting in the spring as well. Uh, but exciting to see, you know, really a lot of these categories coming back. And, you know, one thing's for sure, there's a lot of pent up demand. I just heard an economist talking about uh, pent up demand in the market right now. And that, you know, really, we might have one of our best retail years ever in 2021. Uh, because there's a lot of this pent up demand that people are ready to get out again, ready to spend money. So expect to see that uh, as we as we get further along in 2021. So just continuing on that, that trends uh, theme here, uh, touch-free shopping is going to be the norm. It's already the norm now, but the new norm will be touch-free shopping. So pre-COVID, uh, you know, retail was all about creating an experience for consumers, you know, a place to have not just, not just to go in and buy, you know, uh, goods and services, but, but having an experience there. So we're expecting experience to continue. But also what we're seeing is just this focus by retailers on uh, touch-free shopping. So you might have noticed this as you've been to, to, to a retailer or a restaurant lately, but they're, they're doing contactless checkouts right now. A lot of them are. They're doing scan and go smartphone apps. So maybe you scan your own items and then, and then you walk up and, and, and pay with your, your smartphone. Uh, we're seeing a lot of the buy online, pick up in store, and then the buy online return in store right now. So a lot of people buying online and then maybe picking it up curbside or walking in at a, at a locker. If you've noticed lockers at Home Depot or Walmart, uh, they have lockers where you can go in, type a code in, and you'll be able to pull out the item you bought there. So continue. We expect these things to continue. Uh, we're going to talk more about this, but drive through lanes. Uh, are, we're starting to see more of that. So less walking into the stores or the restaurants and then walk up and take out as well. I, I mentioned scan and go. Uh, but Walmart was one of the first to really do this. A lot of the grocery stores are using this technology, but if you have their app, you basically scan the items yourself and then you check out that way. What that does is it, it helps to eliminate checkout lines. Uh, it reduces the touches that you have at a store. Uh, it requires less staff, uh, faster checkouts. You know, that's something I've always, uh, since Walmart's on the picture here, I've always wanted to see is faster checkouts at Walmart. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been to a Walmart and, you know, there's only been one aisle or, or one checkout lane or two checkout lanes open. So this is helping to speed up uh, that process and, and have, uh, you know, a quicker checkout process. And then what's interesting too, is with these, these apps, these scan and go apps is they're, they're focused on utilizing the, the AI or the artificial intelligence so that, you know, if you buy a certain item, it makes a suggestion, Hey, you bought this, why not try this item? Or, Hey, those, those sort of things. So we're expecting to see that continue as we move forward here. You know, I mentioned this already, but the, the, the buy online pickup in store and the buy online return in store is, is something that we're really, uh, we're really seeing a lot of right now. And uh, you know, what this is, is, is really basically a way to get more consumers. So to get those consumers that are scared to come into the stores or scared to shop there, a way to buy it online and, and then come in and pick it up with convenience. And the same thing with returning, but the way it works is you either buy it on the website or an app and uh, the, you go in, they have lockers um, or they might just have it waiting for you at the front there uh, to do that. The store fulfills the online order, but it's a way to still get consumers in store. So there's so brick and mortar retail is not going away. It's a way to buy online and then still go in store, still have that need for, for that, that physical store. Um, and then in certain locations, this is a Home Depot, for example, but they're going to have protected, uh, protected lockers where you type in a code to get it. Uh, but basically what's happened is these brick and mortar stores have become really many fulfillment centers. So I, I expect a lot of this to continue. Um, but also with the returns, we're, we're seeing a lot of these retailers that offer you can do a return in store or you can return it online. But we found a lot of these retailers are realizing that it's actually just cheaper, depending on the price of the item, to allow the to, to, to refund the money to the consumer and then just let them keep the item. So they, they figured it out that it's just easier uh, to, to save money by, by not dealing with the shipping or, or the consumer sending it back and just letting that consumer keep it while refunding the money. So that's something we're going to continue to see here as well. Uh, 
just a couple of figures here, but 68% of consumers say they are going to use curbside pickup more in the future. So expect curbside pickup. Uh, if you've noticed that whether it's Target or, you know, some of your smaller retailers or smaller, your smaller restaurants, there's designated parking for uh, curbside pickup now. I expect to see that expand uh, going going further. And then 60% of people said they're going to collect more of their online purchases from inside stores. So it's been an easy kind of convenient process. That's something that's going to stick with us as well, uh, really going for, forward here. You know, drive-through lanes are, are something also that, that we're going to see more of in the future. But uh, most, uh, many of the drive-through or, or many of the dine-in restaurants were, were forced to close or forced to, to operate re at reduced capacity. Um, so we've seen a lot of these restaurants focus on delivery. We've seen a lot of them focus on curbside, but really what we've seen them focus on too is drive-through lanes. Um, so we expect to see a very, a very heavy pickup of drive-through lanes. If you, if you think about it, the, the Chick-fil-A model where they typically have two or three lines of drive-through. Um, we expect to see that continue. McDonald's does the same thing, but we expect to, to see a lot of retailers or a lot of restaurants take, uh, you know, kind of follow that lead and, and really focus on uh, having additional uh, drive-through lanes. So expect that to continue. I was on a call just recently with, uh, with Olive Garden. And Olive Garden is even a casual sit down restaurant is playing with having drive throughs Chipotle, the same thing. So this is not just fast food. Uh, this is something that is going to stick with us and be with, with us for a while, not just with quick service restaurants, but the casual restaurants as well. So, you know, as municipalities, if you have codes against drive throughs uh, codes against curbside parking or, or limiting that, you're probably going to have to start taking a look at some of those codes or the way that, 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 that works in your community, because this is something that is going to stick with us, the drive through the curbside now, but also I think in the foreseeable future, two, three, five years, if not forever. Um, so something we're going to see continuing here, you know, in downtown areas, one thing we're seeing a lot of is walk up uh, or, or carry out uh, windows. You know, I was in uh, a community just the other day where, where they have two or three restaurants downtown that have walk-up windows now. And, uh, you know, they have designated parking spots for the walk-up uh, consumer. But a lot of the downtown, more urban settings are struggling. They're, they're struggling to adapt with a lot of these cost, you know, cost strategies and, and those sort of things. But it's pretty easy. It's pretty convenient from a retrofit fit standpoint. Um, it it promotes pedestrian walk-ups and online orders. Uh, so expect to see a lot more of the uh, walk-up kind of carry out, um, especially in the downtown and more urban type areas. You know, e-commerce is, is going to continue to uh, continue to drive a lot of the retail. We saw a very fast increase in online sales because of COVID. We expect that to level out. Now, I'm not saying online sales are going away, but I don't think we're going to see it grow in the next few years as fast as it has maybe the last five or 10 years. However, online uh, retail is here to stick with us for, uh, you know, for the near future. Uh, and it's something that's going to stick around, but, it, but expect to see a lot of those kind of mini fulfillment centers in your retailers and restaurants where you can buy online, have it delivered to you, or you can buy online and pick it up in store. So just to give you an example uh, of the pickup that we've seen, uh, Amazon, for example, they hired 350,000 uh, new employees in 2020. I've seen some, some pretty high projections for 2021. Basically that's, that's driven by the online sales that and the online sales and then and the delivery to the houses and then same thing with you at UPS United uh, uh, Parcel Service they plan to hire more than a hundred thousand during the holidays so just during the holidays they they hired about a hundred thousand and then we're expecting that to continue so the online sales the e-commerce sales that's not going away but the key is the national retailers have figured it out the regional retailers have figured it out but you as municipalities need to work with your small businesses. Uh, your small businesses need to pick up on online sales. They need to pick up on curbside. They need to pick up any way they can to get consumers in. It's, it's convenient now, uh, whether it's using Shopify or Square or some of these others. If your small businesses are not online, there's now a way uh, for them to get on with some of those uh, to, to, to really take advantage and start utilizing e-commerce. So uh, again, if you're downtown mom and pop, businesses are not using e-commerce or not part of it they need to they need to get there quickly 
you know, we're continuing to see the big box stores rule. So, you know, whether you're a, you're a fan of small business or, or big box or both or, or neither, uh, big boxes are continuing to rule the market right now. Uh, many, if not most, if not all of your big box stores were considered essential and were open. Um, so they kept their stores open during lock, lockdown, but the one-stop shops, you know, the targets, the Walmarts, the Best Buys, the Lowe's, uh, they really saw their sales store, uh, their sales soar during the pandemic. And it's because, you know, instead of having to make five different stops, you could get just everything you needed at this one store, but uh, they benefited from the do-it-yourself trends, uh, especially the Lowe's, the Home Depot, uh, big box types. Um, and then consumers tended to not go to malls because of what was going on with COVID. So they were more focused on, you know, these, these one-stop shops and less on the malls, which is why I think we've seen, you know, kind of a demise or a, a downfall of a lot of these malls accelerate uh, this year. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but everything stores, uh, the off mall, the everything stores, we, we expect those to continue to, fry, to thrive in 2021 and beyond. You know, we've also seen this with restaurants. I talked about the, the less touch uh, at restaurants. Sonic, for example. Sonic was, was set up for a pandemic. You know, they, they already had, uh, you know, the drive through the curbside. They had that down. Well, Sonic sales have been up about 29% across the board at all locations. Uh, Chick-fil-A was another. They they've successfully implemented a lot of the less touch, uh, you know, kind of no touch uh, atmospheres. They did that before COVID, but other restaurants are, are, are coming into that. You know, some examples of some restaurants that are doing this uh, are Burger King. This is a new prototype that Burger King is rolling out uh, really this quarter. And you'll start to see this pretty quickly. I, I think they have a few of these planned in Oklahoma. Uh, but, but basically, they're, they're smaller concepts. So you can see uh, they have, it's interesting, it's a two-story concept where they have a walk-up window. They have curbside lanes. They have drive-through lanes. They have a patio. We're going to see a lot more patio in the future, a lot more patio space. And, um, you know, people eating outside, wanting to eat outside. That's going to be a trend that comes from this. Uh, but a number of different trends. Uh, they're going to have pickup lockers as well. Heated pickup lockers where you can order something and then walk up to a, type in your code and get your food out that way. We're already seeing Chipotle do that right now as well. But uh, you know, this is, this is one example of a restaurant uh, evolving or kind of morphing what their, their uh, you know, what, the, what their typical process is, what their typical prototypes are and coming out with a new, new location. You know, Taco Bell is, is really doing the same thing. Taco Bell um, has some smaller concepts that they are, they're rolling out as well. So basically these are roughly 1300 square foot locations uh, compared to their typical 2,500 square foot location. It's called Taco Bell Go, um, you know, no dining room. It's gonna be drive-through only. So maybe you've seen some of the coffee shops that have done that, maybe a Starbucks or some of the others where it's drive-through only. Uh, Taco Bell's getting in on that trend. So we're expecting to see that continue. Uh, you know, what that does is it optimizes ordering ahead. Uh, they're gonna have double drive-through lanes, which you can kind of see here, like the Chick-fil-A and McDonald's model that we've seen before. And then they're also gonna have a one lane that's designated for priority pickups or app orders. So uh, this is another one that's gonna do that. And then they're gonna have bell hops. So they'll have, uh, you can't really see them on the screen here, but they're gonna have people out there taking the orders uh, to help speed up and, and and uh, make that process faster. So one thing I think is interesting with Burger King and Taco Bell with these smaller concepts, uh, they're gonna be able to work on smaller pieces of land. So in the past when Taco Bell or, or Burger King would require at least an acre, they can now make these new concepts work on half an acre to 0.75 acres. So if you have the smaller piece of property in your, your community that's well located that you, you've struggled to figure out what to do with it because of its size, these are some, some possible options to look at. Uh, but, but Taco Bell is, is uh, they're rolling out these first, uh, first locations here as well. Uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken is another fast food user that is starting this. This is actually in Australia, but uh, very similar to Taco Bell. It's it kind of, to me, it seems like when you go through the, the airport, you know, when you go through the line to pay at the airport is kind of the way this is set up, but they're going to have uh, you know, it's a new, new design. Uh, they were already working on this design pre COVID. So pre COVID has just accelerated this, but it, it's basically, they're going to have designated pickup lanes. Uh, you can pay through the app or website. And then 
the designated lane for ordering there. So really with the focus on the app and, and, and ordering ahead, but interesting concept to see, but uh, again, kind of the way of the future as it relates to restaurants. Another example would be Buffalo Wild Wings. Uh, I'm a fan of Buffalo Wild Wings. Uh, we go there quite often, but they're rolling out as a smaller concept as well called Buffalo Wild Wings Go. And uh, I've seen their expansion plans and Oklahoma is in their immediate expansion plans. They're going to start rolling these stores out in the near future here, but it's a smaller concept about 1300 to 1800 square feet. Uh, you can kind of see what that looks up there. They're going to have a walk up counter and then just very limited seating. It looks like four or five tables here, uh, but more of a focus of to go. Uh, they're going to have some patio seating as well. And then again, just like some of the others they are going to have heated takeout lockers. So your food will stay warm. You can take it out. You're not having to really interact with anyone uh, and, and you're going to be able to get that. So pay attention. Buffalo Wild Wings Go is going to is going to expand pretty rapidly. Um, one sector that that has struggled uh, during COVID, but also pre-COVID is uh, the middle market retail. And when, when we talk about middle market retail, uh, you know, that's the Macy's of the world. You know, that's the Kohl's, the, the, the gaps and some of those, they, they've struggled recently. A lot of those mall retailers, uh, you know, Macy's just announced they're closing 45 stores. I think a couple of those are in Oklahoma. Uh, Kohl's has closed some stores and, and, and some of Kohl's is downsized, you know, from an 80,000 square foot store, they, they've downsized to maybe 40,000 square feet and then leased out the rest of that 40,000 square feet. But the, the malls have taken a hit. A lot of the department stores, uh, basically wealthy consumers are saving money by working from home. They're not eating out. They're not traveling. They're not going to these middle market stores. Uh, but the less fortunate consumers are flocking to the deep discounters uh, and, and are being forced to cut back even more. So because of that, the mid market stores are, are just struggling. And, and I think that's going to be something we continue to see uh, going forward here. You know, we've also seen... Uh, during COVID really just an accelerated decline of malls, uh, the enclosed malls, you know, they were, they've been declining in the last five or 10 years, but with, with movie theaters, not, not doing well, entertainment, not doing well, a lot of the department stores not doing well, we've seen really an accelerated decline uh, for enclosed malls. So unfortunately I'm a fan of the mall. I love going to the mall. My kids love going to the mall, uh, but malls are, are, are evolving. They're changing. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see over the next one to two to three to five years what, what a mall looks like going forward. We've, we were already seeing the kind of the reverse of malls, so bringing the inside out and turning them into more, uh, more lifestyle centers, if you will, more outdoor type malls. I expect that to continue. But, uh, you know, what's happening here is the owners of these malls, you know, a lot of their tenants are unable to pay rents. A lot of the a lot of the larger retailers can't pay rents. Uh, the owners are having trouble servicing their debts. And then we're seeing a lot of these store closings. So it, it's, it's becoming harder and harder to backfill these large spaces that you might have from a Sears or you might have from a, a Macy's or a JCPenney's that's gone out. So work with your mall owners. If you, if you are a community with the mall, work with them to maybe, you know, not pitch that, that Sears store or Sears vacant space is a hundred thousand square feet, but you know, pitch it as, you know, three 30,000 square foot locations or three 30,000 square foot retailers. We've seen that work really well here, but unfortunately I think uh, we're going to continue to see this, this rapid decline of enclosed malls going forward here. Now, this is a funny one to kind of wrap up this wrap up the trend section. And I want to talk to you a little bit about retail recruitment, uh, but expect the zoom dressing to continue. Uh, this was really funny, but uh, the, the sale of sweatpants, uh, pajamas, and, and athleisure or workout apparel has, has spiked uh, recently as, as really employees, many employees have shifted to working uh, from home. The athleisure wear, so like your Nike, Nikes, your Lululemons, your Outdoor Voices, your Champions, your Rones, we're seeing all of those, you know, the, the, the ladies' tights and athletic gear and men's athletic gear, they've, we've seen a huge rise in sales there. But not so much in the uh, not so much in the dress clothes uh, category. There, thought this was interesting. But Walmart in March, when the COVID uh, pandemic hit, they uh, their sales of their tops, okay, so their shirts and women's women's uh, blouses and, and and dress coats and all of those. There was a spike in sales in those, but the bottoms there were down. People were not buying pants, 
So this is a perfect example of uh, kind of the Zoom dressing that we talk about here, but expect this to continue as these apparel stores are trying to figure out, you know, how to, how to survive, how to, how to accelerate their sales coming future. So you might pay attention to this, but expect to see uh, big discounts on pants and shorts and, and those sort of things. And, and maybe not as big of a discount on the, on the tops uh, going forward here, but this was a perfect picture for that. Uh, as, as we go forward here. But I want to leave you with this from a trend standpoint. We, we put together a list of those retailers and restaurants that we know will be expanding in 2021. Uh, so you can see some of those from at home to Costco, to Dollar General, to, to Target, to Raising Cane's, to Texas Roadhouse, you name it, they're, they're on this list, uh, they're expanding. And then there's a full list at this link. So I mentioned it again, we had another question asked if we were going to have this available uh, to uh, after the presentation. So Katie will make sure, uh, our marketing manager Katie will make sure and send out an email of this, but take a hard look at it because these are the retailers, these are the restaurants that will be expanding in 2021. And, and, and really that's a great kind of lead way, kind of segue into uh, the last five or six slides that we have here. Uh, but but want to talk to you, so those are the trends and what we're seeing in retail, but as municipalities, as economic development organizations, we cannot forget about retail recruitment. Uh, you know, maybe it has been slow for you. Your, your community hasn't seen a lot of growth this last, in 2020, 2021 is, is going, we're going to see some rapid expansion of some of these retailers and restaurants. And as municipalities, it's up to you to get out there and, and really prove why you have the better community over maybe some of your competition. The, uh, some of the categories that, that, that I mentioned already, you know, the home improvements, the grocery stores, the, uh, the, the other categories we've talked about, the fast food, the restaurants, they're going to expand rapidly. And, and, and again, what can you do to put your community in front? But, but at the end of the day, retailers know uh, what retailers, what they're looking for in a site. They know what kind of communities they're looking for. Uh, they know what they, they need, like I said, in a site. Do they need two acres? Do they need five acres? But the problem is during the pandemic, they haven't been able to travel. So they haven't been able to drive out to Stillwater. They haven't been able to drive out to Lawton or Elk City or some of these other communities in Oklahoma. So they've been having to do all of this via the computer. Uh, they've been having to try to find sites uh, in your community. So now because of that, we uh, it's up to you as municipalities. You've got to work harder to get these sites in front of these prospects. Good example here. One thing I want to I want to emphasize is the importance. If you're a municipality, I want to emphasize the importance of focusing not on your community population, but your trade area population. So where people come from to shop and eat. As a retailer, as a restaurant, that's what I want to know. You know, I I could care less what your census number is for the city. I want to know how big is your trade area. So a good example here is Lawton, Oklahoma. Everybody probably knows where Lawton is. Um, you can see it on the map there. Lawton's a, a population of about ninety four thousand. So 94,000 people will live within the city limits of Lawton, uh, but their trade area population or where they pull people from is now 273,000. So if I'm a retailer and I'm a restaurant, I'm looking for, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to locate 10 communities in, or I'm going to locate 10 process, 10 retailers uh, locations in a community. I'm going to open up stores in communities. I want to know, okay, not what your community population, but what is your trade area population? So 274,000 looks a lot better than 94,000. So even if you're a small community, let's say, and we've got some small communities on here with us today, but let's say you're a community population of 2,000. That's not what you want to pitch. You want to pitch that community, that trade area population you have of, of, of 10,000 or more. So, you know, a good question here that just came in was how do we determine these trade areas? Well, the, the most common way to determine a trade area right now is using cell phone data. So if you have a cell phone, like I do right here, uh, or, you know, two, many of us, it's kind of scary to think about you're being tracked. But as you move about in a community, as your consumers, that is your citizens come in, uh, these retailers, these restaurants, uh, the retail coach, we're tracking where you come from. So we're now using cell phone technology. So this lot in Oklahoma trade area that we outlined here. This was based on, on cell phone data. Let me back up here real quick. Uh, so what we were able to do is we were able to plot on a map where those consumers were coming from, what their home locations were. And, and that's how we were able to determine this trade area. So cell phone data is one way to do it. 
uh, we used to we used to drive around uh, at the retail coast. We used to drive around and, and use uh, license plate data. We would scan license plates just like a Google. You see the Google cars going around, you know, doing the satellite imagery or you know uh, the the imagery they do there. We had these little cameras. We would do that, and we would go by and get get uh, license plates. Cell phone technology has just made it that much more uh, easy to get this information. And that's what retailers want to see. They don't want to know how many people live within a 10 mile radius of your community. They don't want to know how many people live within a 10 minute drive time. They want to know factual data, cell phone data of, of where your people are coming from. So I'll just, I'll, I'll hype on it one more time, but make sure, uh, make sure you know what your retail trade area population is and that you're selling that to the prospects that you're going after. This trade area information is also incredibly helpful to your local businesses. You know, if it's a local business that's maybe in your downtown area, the trade area helps them understand where do they need to be marketing to? Are, are they make, marketing just to the city limits or are they marketing to the, the other areas in your trade area? So continue to, continue to focus on uh, your trade area as you do recruitment. Also, you've got to have a strong data focus. Retailers and restaurants want to see up-to-date data on your community. So if you still have 2020, 2010 census data on your, on your website or you still have 2015 data, make sure you get that information updated. Uh, if you have questions on that, I'm, I can help you with that. But 2021 data is already out there. So retailers, restaurants, these prospects, they're looking for population. They're looking for population growth in your community and your trade area. They're looking for your race distribution. They're looking for your incomes. They want to know this information and it has to be up to date. So when, when you're reaching out or, or doing outreach to a prospect, make sure you have this information for them. Hey, I, I know you're looking to, to locate, you know, 10 stores in Oklahoma. I, I'd love for you to take a look at our community. And here's why. We have a trade area population of 200,000. We have average household incomes of 95,000. Those are the, the, the bullet points or the, the benchmarks that these retailers and restaurants look for. And, and it's key to, to make sure you're getting this information in front of them. It's up to you as municipalities to do that. Again, because you're competing with communities right next to you, but also communities throughout the entire state. Uh, and, and you want to shine your community in the best light. So make sure that data is up to date and, and ready to go. One other thing that uh, retailers and restaurants want to know is, is, is what is your demand? What is your retail demand? So, you know, it's, it's good to know, hey, you want us in your community or you, you want this retailer to come, but, but they've got to know that there's, there's, there's money for them to be made there, that there's enough demand. So this is an, exam, an example of a demand report or a demand outlook report. And, and what this does is this looks at roughly 80 sectors. So everything from, you know, automotive dealers to household appliance stores to restaurants, you name it, there's a category that a restaurant or a retailer would fit into. And, and this looks at total demand. So it looks at this, this report looks at 2020 demand um, and then 2025 demand. Uh, so it projects out for the next five years, but, but retailers, I, I, I know a lot of communities and we, we did this in the past. We provided leakage reports. Uh, you know, how much money is leaking or leaving your community and going outside and, and being spent at the Oklahoma cities or out, outside at the, at the Stillwaters or outside at the Tulsa's. Well, Leakage analysis have really become a thing in the past. And, and what retailers want to see is those demand outlook reports, those demand, what is the opportunity now, but in the future? Because if you're working with a prospect or you're working with a retailer or a restaurant, they really have to go pitch your community to their board of directors, or they have to go pitch it to their real estate committee. And that real estate committee is going to say, okay, we, we understand there's demand now, but how much will that demand grow? over the next one year, over the next five years, because they're planning out and, and they have to open up stores that are consistently going to do, uh, consistently going to be successful. So this report shows the compound annual growth rate on here, uh, but make sure you're not just saying, come to my community. You're not just saying, hey, here's our retail trade area. Make sure you're also providing and showing these retailers, these prospects, what the demand is and how much opportunity exists in your community. You know, on top of the data, on top of the trade area, uh, really as municipalities, you have got to take a hard focus or a hard look at what sites are available in your community. And, and you need to have a database of sites. So when I say sites, you know, a site could be a vacant piece of land, but it could also be, you know, an existing building that, you know, is vacant. It, it could be a, a shopping center that has, you know, lease space available in it. 
Retailers and restaurants need to know what space is available. So if you don't have this already, make sure you have a database of available sites so that if Chick-fil-A decides they're going to come to your community or start looking in your community, you can go back and you say, hey, you can say, hey, Chick-fil-A, we've got five two acre sites that fit what you're looking for. And what we found is when the municipality or economic development group provides this information, uh, provides the site information to the prospects, it speeds up that process by almost six to 12 months in many cases. So provide sites, have those sites ready for these, these retailers. And then, you know, if you have a retailer or, your, or a restaurant stop by your office and say, hey, we're looking or, or send you an email and say, we're looking to come to your community, get that information out on sites the same day if possible. And having a database will help you get that out there. Because again, you're competing, not just with those communities directly around you, but communities throughout the entire state for prospects. You know, one thing you can do uh, when you're putting this database of sites together is, you know, kind of try looking at the, 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 your community through the eyes of a retailer. Try driving down all of your main corridors and, and, and try focusing on looking at maybe, maybe vacant land. Maybe it's redevelopment properties that you've overlooked in the past and really haven't looked at as, as a retail opportunity. Try, try doing that. Look at it through the eyes of a retailer. Conduct the highest and best use analysis. You know, we do these highest and best use or land use analysis for, for our municipal clients all the time. Uh, but basically looking at certain sites that are not serving their highest and best use. So is it, you know, a rundown gas station that could be turned into a uh, coffee house uh, like you see in this on the screen at the bottom here? You know, be creative, be unique. Uh, retailers and restaurants are looking at opportunities, whether it's existing land or you know, existing properties that are there. It's a lot easier right now with construction prices to go into a lease space, to go into an existing building than it is than having to build ground up. So make sure you know what lots are available, what sites are available. And don't be afraid to, you know, if you have two or three pad sites right next to each other, don't be afraid to try to pitch those or sell those as, as a larger property and maybe open you up to a larger retailer. That's something to really look at. Get to know your landowners, get to know your property owners, uh, get to know your landlords, have a good relationship with them so that when a space becomes available, you're the first call they make. Uh, so you, you can update that database and keep it going. A couple more slides here, uh, but, but really target retailers that fit. I, I can't really stress this enough, but uh, you know, I, I work with small, medium, large communities, but, but really in a lot of smaller communities, uh, you know, it, it's a community of 2,000, trade area 5,000, and, and they want to recruit a Costco. Uh, they want to recruit a Bass Pro Shops. They want to recruit a Walmart. And, and in many cases, uh, those retailers just don't fit your community. You don't have the traffic counts they look for. You don't have the trade area size they look for. You don't have the certain demographics they're looking for. So make sure you're targeting retailers and restaurants that fit your community based on that trade area size, based on your demographics, uh, especially after, after COVID and what a lot of these retailers and restaurants have been through. Uh, we're seeing a lot of these retailers, all of the retailers, they're looking for the sure thing. They can't afford to open a, a non, a, an unsuccessful location. So they, they're spending more time choosing locations. They're spending more time doing the analysis. But you as a community, you as an economic development official, you can get them this information to make sure they're making the right decision. But all of these retailers, I've got a few on the screen here, Zaxby's, Dunkin' Donuts, and Firehouse Subs. These are some of the criteria they look for. And uh, it's important to get this information in front of them. Market your community everywhere you go. Make sure your websites are up to date. Make sure, again, that database of sites we talked about, make sure it's on your website. But especially, it's been accelerated during COVID. We've got site selectors that are on your city websites on a daily basis. We've got, you know, before they come to a community, they're looking at your website. And if you don't have a website or your website doesn't have any economic development or retail information on it, chances are they're going to look at other communities. So make sure your, your, your websites are up to date with data. Make sure they've got sites available. All of that information retailers and restaurants look for on a regular basis. And then be seen at industry events. I know this is maybe sounds like something silly to think about right now, um, but, but we're going to be back to conferences here pretty soon. Mike and I were talking about maybe some conferences they'll be looking at you know, hopefully later in the year. Uh, but it's incredibly important to be seen and get out there and mingle with 
uh, you know, those brokers, those retailers, those developers. So there's two organizations I want to make you aware of if you aren't already. But the International Council of Shopping Centers, uh, you can see they have they have uh, regional and also uh, national events every year where basically these are opportunities for municipalities to go out and pitch your community to retailers and restaurants and developers and brokers and you name it just investors. So if you're not a member of ICSE, uh, I'm not a spokesperson for ICSE, but I would encourage you to become a member of ICSE. As a municipality, you can become a member of this organization for only $100. And that's $100 a year. What that what that gets you is uh, cheaper admittance into their, their trade shows they have. Some of those are going to be online for the next few months. But, but maybe by June and it, towards the end of the year, we'll be, we'll be going to uh, trade shows again. And then they're always filtering out and getting information to you. So these are the retailers that are expanding. These are webinar opportunities. So if you're a municipality and you're not a member of International Com Council of Shopping Centers, I'd recommend you do that. I, I do just want to point out they're, they're lar the largest real estate conference in the world is put on by ICSE, and that's called IC ICSE Recon. Uh, that typically happens in May of every year. They've actually moved it back this year to December. So it's going to be December 5th through 7th of 2021. So I just wanted, they just announced that. So I wanted to make sure that was on your calendar. Uh, but International Council of Shopping Center, look into that. If you have questions on that, you can ask me about it. I'll help you point you in the right direction. And then also Retail Live. Just want to emphasize uh, the importance of Retail Live. It's another uh, little bit smaller organization or quite a bit smaller organization than ICSE, but they hold uh, regional events. I think the closest regional event uh, for Oklahoma is going to be in Austin, Texas. So uh, that usually happens around August or September. But just like ICSE, I, I would recommend you look at attending, uh, you know, maybe becoming a member of Retail Live. There's some, some definite opportunities there. And I especially think with, with a lot of these trade shows being canceled the last 12 months or so, we're going to see a lot higher attendance at these trade shows going forward. And it's going to be even more important as a municipality. If you're going to pitch your, uh, pitch your community, it's going to become even more uh, important to get there. So, you know, that's, I, I wanted to keep to 45 minutes because I know y'all's, y'all's time is valuable, but uh, we'll go ahead and open it up for some questions here. Uh, if there are any additional questions, I know I've answered a few as we've gone along, but my cell number is on here, 662-231-0608. My email address is on here. If you have any questions on any of this, uh, I just like to talk retail. So if you have any questions or, or thoughts or ideas you want to you wanna run through or talk through with me, feel free to, to reach out to me on, at my email or on my cell phone. Uh, but it looks like we do have a few questions coming in here real quick. Uh, so a question was asked, is 2018 data new enough data uh, to, to have on your website? So 2018 data is not terrible. Um, I would recommend still that you would update the data to 2021 information if you can. Uh, you can reach out to us uh, and I can help point you in the right direction for that. Uh, but make sure those, those websites are up to date. Uh, another question was uh, about restaurants. Do, do we see... Do we think many of the casual sit-down restaurants will, will take on the drive-through, um, you know, drive-through model? Um, you know, it's interesting to see. I I don't know that you're going to see a lot of the casual sit-down restaurants. So your Texas Roadhouse, your Chili's. I don't think we're going to see a lot of those. Uh, we'll probably see some of them take on the drive-through uh, model. But I think a lot of that curbside and delivery is something we're going to see more from from those casual sit-down restaurants. But expect the restaurant industry to continue to expand pretty rapidly here into 2021 um, and, and be something that uh, we see happen. But, but especially the, the fast food and, and even what we call the quick service or quick casual, uh, your Chipotle's, your Panera Bread's um, and, and others like that, expect to see those, those pick up the drive through models. Maybe not as much for casual, but the quick service and then the quick casuals, we're going to see that happen. Let's see. Any any other questions before we before we log off here? I want to make sure and, and thank uh, the Oklahoma Municipal League. I want to make sure and thank Mike and his team there. They've they've been incredibly helpful getting this information out here. We're excited about uh, you know just getting back to it and, and some of the training programs that y'all are doing at Oklahoma Municipal League and 
uh, just really excited about what's coming in retail. But again, if you have any questions going forward, um, let us know. Katie's going to make sure and get a copy of this presentation out uh, a little bit later today and also a recording of it. So uh, if you have any other questions, just reach out to us at, at my email address or our website and we'll be sure to answer them. But thanks for the opportunity and uh, we, uh, we'll talk to everybody soon.